Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian Smith back with another episode of Grief to Growth, and today I've got with me Nancy Van Alphen, and I'm going to introduce Nancy, and then we'll have a conversation like we always do. Um, uh, Nancy is the author of In Between Heaven and Earth, My Profound Encounters with God and the Remarkable Truth of Our Existence. Uh, And in that book, Nancy takes us on her unexpected spiritual journey that changed her from an agnostic to a believer. As As a teen, Nancy concluded that God was unprovable and she never looked back until God decided he wasn't being content being a mere possibility. And Nancy had some experiences that woke her up from that. Um, Her encounters with the divine prompted her to turn from agnostic to full-time activist in humanity's spiritual awakening. Uh, Her background as a journalist and a marketing professional serves her mission well in authoring her book about her experiences. And Nancy now lectures on spirituality and has been a volunteer with the International Association for Near-Death Studies, which is otherwise known as IONS, as well as facilitating a South Jersey spiritual meetup group. Nancy has worked as a hospice volunteer and has been a big sister in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. She earned her bachelor's degree from Oberlin College. Uh, we found out we were both Buckeyes. Uh, I'm from Ohio and went to Ohio State. Uh, Nancy majored in anthropology and contributed original research on Lucy, the missing link between primates and hominids. And after her, spiritual, her spiritual experiences, she found evolutionism and spirituality be, to be non-exclusive. So we're going to talk about that as well. So with that, I want to welcome you, Nancy, to, to Grief to Growth. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for having me on the program. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to meet you and talk to you about your book and your experiences. Um, you, you said in your bio that you kind of started off as agnostic, and I know you had some religious background, so I think you went from religious to agnostic to how would you kind of characterize yourself today? Uh, well, today I'm a, a full-on believer in uh, God, although I don't believe you can put God in a box. Mm -hmm. It's too big for that. Uh, We have a very hard time to define God because I don't really believe that we have the words for that. But we'll we'll, we'll get into that later. I do know a little bit about, uh, you know, who God is and and who we are in relation to God. But to give you a little bit of uh, my background, Mm -hmm. you are correct. Uh, In my youth, I had a smattering of religion up until I was about eight, ten years old. Uh, my mother was brought up Roman Catholic, so on an occasional Sunday, we would be in Catholic service, um, and of course, you know, on Christmas and Easter, the important holidays. Yeah. Uh, my father's father, my grandfather, was a Baptist preacher, oh, wow. so when we would stay at my paternal grandparents' house, my sister and I, we would always go to church with them on Sunday, and it was traditional Baptist, you know, it was uh, fire and brimstone and, uh, mm. you know, um, rolling and up and down the aisles and, and uh, the whole shebang. So it was this dichotomy of very uh, demure, petite, uh, quiet, contemplative kind of services with the services that were just, you know, really uh, would you know, just get you in an uproar and, uh, you know, really the spirit would get into people. And uh, it was just that, that dichotomy. But I have to say it wasn't that often because uh, again, we went to church once in a while with my mom and it wasn't every weekend that we stayed at my grandparents' house. So it was, it was kind of this smattering of religion. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because my grandfather was a Pentecostal pastor. So as you said that I was, I was just remembering, I I grew up in his church. So, um, but he was raised Methodist. So he had this kind of a weird thing where he was a very, uh, I guess, uh, kind of intellectual kind of person, but also the whole Pentecostal thing going on. So I can relate to those, those two kind of things playing off each other. 
So and as, there's a lot of rules around them, a lot of rules mm-hmm. and strictness in, in both religion and in most religions. Yeah. So yeah. this was your, your background. And then as a teenager, I think you said you became agnostic. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. As I started to mature and um, think about things, uh, you know, I would hear about other religions and uh, other ideas about God and so forth. And my dad himself, even though his father was a Baptist preacher, my dad was, I would say, more on the side of agnostic. Mm -hmm. Um, Although he never labeled himself or anything, he did not go to church and he sort of you know, poo-pooed his own dad when his dad would talk about, you know, there's heaven or there's hell or whatever. My dad really didn't believe too much of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the different influences, my dad, other kids at school, different things that you would hear on TV or whatnot, actually had me thinking. And it was for a very short period of time. Uh, I remember when it sort of struck me that, you know, could this, you know, there's, there's these differing opinions and could God be real or could God not be real? What's Mm -hmm. going on here? Mm -hmm. And my very logical self decided that there was just no way to know because these people say this, these people say that. And I don't think you can really know that. That's what I thought in in my, you know, very young preteen to teen years that God was unprovable and anything spiritual was unprovable. But uh, I did retain two things from my earlier years in church. And those two things were um, the golden rule. So I I latched onto that and I thought that's really a cool way to live, you know, and it makes sense. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And so I sort of adopted that as my de facto way of living. Um, But the other thing that I retained was prayer. And that's very surprising because Mm, if you don't really necessarily think God is there, then why are you praying? Yeah. But, uh, and I never really questioned that too much. Again, I I didn't label myself or think of myself as atheist. I thought maybe there's a God, maybe there's not, but you just can't prove it. Mm -hmm. So my prayer was sort of, I guess, half-hearted. I didn't know if anybody was really listening to me. I didn't really care too much. It was just somewhat habitual, even though my family didn't pray, you know, Mm. I was never taught that, Hey, you need to pray before you go to bed or whatever. It was just something I personally did. And as I got a little bit older, I did realize that it's a little weird. I'm not sure God's there, but yet I'm praying to a God. I don't really, you know, know, know is there. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, well, praying really relieves me of a lot of stresses. So it it began to take on, or I began to think of my prayer in much more the way you would um, think of getting your thoughts out onto a diary. You know, you're releasing your thoughts, you're releasing your stresses as you write them out Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatnot. So that's how I reasoned uh, myself with prayer. You know, I I was just, it was kind of a form of meditation, if you will. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that does surprise me. You say that prayer would be one of the two things you retain. Yeah. So what, what prompted you to start believing again? Well, this is where my real story comes in my Mm -hmm. STE, my spiritually transformative experience. And it wasn't just one experience, Brian, it was a series of what I call core experiences because these core experiences are really what changed me. I realized that I'd had experiences before and after, um, but those core experiences were really what took me from being agnostic to 100% full on believer. Mm. And how it started was very interesting. And I'd like to relate this to the current situation of the pandemic. Sure. Because when people talk about uh, a silver lining in, in their struggles and so forth, and I do talk about that in my book, uh, that struggle and and um, suffering are challenges, and they are actually gifts. They're gifts to teach us. And I think in this pandemic, one of the gifts it brings us is the gift of silence, patience, a calming down of your life, if you will. So most people are working at home now, and it's not quite the same as the hustle and bustle of everyday life. We're sort of 
forced to calm down and, and be quiet a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what started my core experiences. Uh, so to launch a little bit into the details, I was home alone one night. And actually, before I say that, what, what had quieted down in my life, I had always been a career girl, you know, working the uh, corporate world, the much more than nine to five, you know, often getting home at eight o'clock at night. But at one point, I was able to take a step back, and uh, I originally intended to spend some time with my daughter, who was going to be going off to college uh, after her senior year, and it was the summer before her senior year, the spring before her senior year, mm -hmm. and luckily, my husband was doing great in his job, so I stepped out of my job, and uh, I was able to enjoy what I refer to as the uh, previously elusive life of leisure. <laughs> so I was going to spend this time with my daughter. Unfortunately, if you, well, you have a daughter and mm -hmm. you know, once they get in their junior, senior year, even before that, but they don't have time for their parents. So I was just fooling myself to think that she would spend some time with me, Yeah, but she didn't. So I was kind of alone. My husband travels a lot. My daughter was off doing a million and one things, not with me. Um, and I was able to calm my life down. It was mm -hmm. just, it went from this whirlwind of activity and corporate work and family things and all of those kinds of things to sort of just all of a sudden being alone and having downtime and quiet time. And the thought, uh, the phrase always occurs to me when I talk about this, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. I was able to be still in my life and in my thinking. I didn't have all the worries of uh, the worries of bills being paid. We were doing good. I didn't have the worries of the corporate life and so forth. So one night I was home alone and I was laying on the couch, just going on my iPad, reading different stories about this and that. And I came across a uh, story about a boy who was dying. And by this time, actually, he had died. So the, the link, the story was a little bit old. And it had a link in within the story to some YouTube videos this boy had made. And these videos were all about his impending death and how he felt about it. And it just grabbed me. It, it really touched me. And, uh, you know, things like I could never play sports with my buddies, you know my sister is, is really depressed because she knows I'm going to die. And, and he was such a, uh, you know, the, he, he just had a warmth about him. And the, the boy's name was Ben Breedlove. And I like to just mention a side note uh, about his last name, Breedlove. I think that's important. And, and I have a lot of thoughts about uh, hints that we leave ourselves in, mm -hmm. in names and things like that. But that's a whole other story. Yeah. Uh, so his name's Ben Breedlove. And I watched his first YouTube video, and uh, as I was laying on the couch, I started to cry, and I started to, you know, t tears started coming out, and I was just like, how, how can this be? You know, such a wonderful young man who has so much to offer, how can this be? And, hmm. and it was just, I had a lump in my throat. And I got up off the couch to go get a drink of water, and the distance between the couch and the kitchen, uh, as I walked that distance, my sadness morphed into anger. And I kid you not, Brian, I raised my fists up at God and a God who I didn't really know was there. Yeah. And I was mad. And I said, why do people have to suffer? I don't understand suffering. And I was using that word suffering over and over, mm -hmm. uh, which is, wasn't a word I used often, but that was what, was what was coming out of my mouth. Why do we have to suffer? I don't understand suffering. Just suffer. And I remember slamming my fist on the counter and, you know, suffering is bullshit. Mm -hmm. I yelled that. And almost to the, the second that I, you know, yelled that, there was a boom, boom, boom on my front door. 
it startled me because, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't expecting anyone. <laughs> it was, you know, getting to be dusk. My husband was traveling. Daughter was out. No one ever came to our front door because everyone who knew us knew to come around to the side because our house was located on a corner. Mm. So it startled me a little bit, but, you know, I, I wiped the tears away that were still on my face. And I walked what was probably, oh gosh, I'm really bad with the, the amount of distance, but it was just a few, I would say 12 paces from mm -hmm. where the couch was to the front door, mm -hmm. 12 to 15 paces. So um, I walked from the kitchen over to the front door and normally I would, you know, especially with my husband being away, I would kind of try to see who was out there, whatever, but I didn't. For some reason, unbeknownst to myself, I just opened the door. And there were two people standing there. Uh, they were older. Uh, at the top stoop, the one who had knocked on the door was a gentleman with a cane, uh, a little bit, um, both of the people were kind of robust. Mm. The gentleman had a cane. The woman was two steps down on the sidewalk where the sidewalk met the porch. She had a black shawl on. I remember exactly what they looked like. Mm. But I opened the door and the gentleman said, the only thing that they would say to me. So I opened the door and I said, yes. And he said, we just came to tell you that suffering isn't going to last forever. Oh, wow. <laughs> Those exact words. Yeah. And my heart jumped. I was like, oh. I mean, I felt at that moment that God was answering me, wow. even though I wasn't sure there was a God there. And I really never gave God hardly any thought at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, I looked at him and I said, okay. And he shakes his head and I look to the woman and she's nodding in agreement. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, okay. And they didn't say anything else. It was an awkward moment. I was waiting for them to say right. more. Yeah. And they didn't. So I started to close the door slowly. And I said, well, good luck with your mission. And they're still, you know, uh -huh. and I shut the door. That's all they said. That is all they said. Wow. That is all they said. Okay. So uh, I have to add, the gentleman did hand me something as he said that. Mm -hmm. So it was a little tiny little pamphlet, just a leaflet actually. So I had that in my hand, closed the door, stunned. I walked, you know, the 12 paces back to the couch. I sat down and just as my butt would sit the couch, I was like, wait a minute, you know, I want to find out where they're from. I'm right. really thinking to look at this little leaflet. I was so stunned. Yeah. So I immediately walked back to the front door. I expected them to just be turning around. I mean, they were old and the gentleman had a cane. I opened the door <laughs> and Brian, they were gone. Wow utterly and completely gone. And I was flabbergasted when I opened the door that they weren't still standing there. Mm -hmm. So I walked out. I, I remember I was in my bare feet. I walked out. I walked, uh, you know, I looked this way. I looked that way up and down the street. And it was a very quiet street that we were on. Um, it was a, I call it an almost empty nester street. You mm -hmm. know, there were no kids playing outside. It was quiet. There were no cars driving away. I, I, you know, tiptoed on the concrete over to the other side of the house, the, the main road, which is also a quiet road. It was a mm -hmm. neighborhood. There was nothing. I looked at the other, you know, doorways of the other house, absolutely nothing. And I was stunned. Um, I was like, where did they go? They couldn't have, where are they? Yeah. I mean, it was, first of all, what they told me was flabbergasting. And then them being gone was just shocking. Yeah. So I went back inside and almost in a daze, I was like fluffing pillows and, you know, just doing whatever thinking, what the heck was that? Um, and I couldn't discount the fact that it felt like God had responded to me in yeah. this manner. So anyway, after that feeling died off a little bit, I, I sat back down on the couch and I picked up my iPad and I'm like, okay, what was I doing? Mm-hmm. And I remembered I was reading the story about Ben or I was watching his video and he had made a second video. So I started to watch that second video. And in that second video, he talked about the time that he actually died 
uh, he was at school and he had a, he had a heart condition hmm. and something happened and he actually collapsed and had what we call a near death experience. Mm -hmm. So he was dead. And when I won't give you his whole story, you can certainly look that up on YouTube as well. But when he came back, uh, he says that he met God and angels. And so at the end of his video, he he's holding up a, a, some note cards as he tells his story. And his last two note cards were, uh, do you believe in God and angels? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, holy mackerel. It's like this kid is now talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen that. I have to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Breedlove. And I believe his sister wrote a book about his experiences. Mm -hmm. So that is how it all started. I could not, after that episode happened, I could not get it off my mind. And uh, from there, I, tr I tried to, you know, when my husband returned from travels, I told him about this thing that happened that was probably the weirdest thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, yeah, well, just kind of weird coincidence or whatever. Yeah. I told other people and they said, they've said, well, maybe they were hiding in the bushes and heard you yelling at God. And yeah. Like, well, number one, I didn't have <laughs> bushes in front of my house. Number two, the windows weren't open. Yeah. Number three, how do you explain that they just disappeared? Yeah. Well, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Our, we want to explain these things in natural ways, and that, make, that makes some sense. I mean, that's, that's the first thing we should do rather than looking for miracles. But the other thing about what you said, Nancy, that really impresses me as I've talked to people that have gone through near-death experiences, et cetera, it's all about timing. It's, it's synchronicities. It's about timing. So if they had come to your door on another day at another time and said that, it might it wouldn't have been nearly as meaningful but it's Absolutely. it's the timing of those two events together and i'm i'm an engineer and i was talking with a, a fellow engineer whose son sends him signs you know from the other side and we talked about this like our minds go to what, let's calculate the odds okay what are the odds that they would come to the door at the time that you were having that experience and they're they're astronomical they're they're in, incalculable that's exactly right and since my experiences i've learned so much more i mean the, my, these experiences set me on a, an entirely different path of learning and knowing and it just, they just changed my life entirely yeah so so is that when you started to study near-death experiences after you after no the... not quite not okay. quite because um i was a very logical thinking person mm -hmm. uh my major in, in in college was as i said uh, archaeology anthropology mm -hmm. you know the study of uh the rise from uh, Australopithecus afarensis to you know hominids that we are today, and mm -hmm. and I was more of the 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 belief in um you know by that time in college I had started to lean more toward atheism, and that may have been partial part and partial of the fact that I was uh, married to a gentleman, very smart uh, gentleman that uh, went to Yale University, and you know I I always looked up to him. He was very intellectual in that way. And I started to lean more toward his thinking, mm -hmm. not because he ever tried to convince me, but just because I, I was latching onto that more and more, mm -hmm. my own logical kind of self uh, being what, you know, the thinking that I normally adhered to. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, to continue a little bit with the story, I yeah. brushed it all off. You know, I, I was just like, that just was some couple very weird coincidences that I can't explain. And I tried to forget about it. But uh, God wanted to continue this conversation that I apparently started. <laughs> and they say sometimes, you know, when you open the door just a crack and you let God in, look out because he's going to swing that door open. Mm -hmm. And that is what happened to me. So uh, the second part of my experience, uh, the, of my core experiences, I was asleep one night. And... Uh, you know, when I, when I first began to tell my story to people, I, I always hesitated to say I was sleeping because then people immediately say, oh, well, of course it was a dream. Mm -hmm. But I cannot tell you how different this was than a dream. And I know now, too, if you look at different histories and different religions and the Bible and so forth, is um, God talks to us in our sleep. 
you know, in our, he comes to us through our dreams and, and, and whatnot. And, and that's simply because on the science end of things, which I'm very interested in as well, um, all of us experiencers tend to know that the brain is a kind of a reducing valve for consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the co consciousness, you know, we only let so much in, but when we are asleep and we can kind of turn off all the things that our consciousness is in tune to, we let uh, other things in. So that's how I kind of in interpret it. But I was asleep one night and uh, as I was sleeping, I was awakened, if you will, uh, by someone standing to the left and in the distance. And it was almost as if, if someone would say, hey, hey, over here. <laughs> and so I sort of awoke within myself. My eyes were still closed, but my consciousness awoke. And I looked in that direction. And in the distance was Jesus. Hmm. And as soon as I saw him, I'm, I'll have to clarify that in a moment, but as soon as I saw him, I knew immediately who he was. And it was almost like seeing an old friend in the grocery store when you didn't expect to see them there. You know, you hadn't seen him in a very long time. Yeah. And I was like, Jesus, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and of course, I didn't really formulate those words, but mm -hmm. it was kind of a thought, you know, that mm -hmm. went out. Jesus, what are you doing here? You're mm -hmm. not supposed to be here right now. Um, so let me just step back a little bit because a lot of people, well, what did Jesus look like? Uh, well, when I saw him in the distance, it wasn't quite that I saw him. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I saw the thing. It was a figure, but it was cloudy, cloudy, billowy figure with gold and purple light swirling around. Mm. That's how I saw him. Mm -hmm. And... I tell people now, it doesn't really matter what Jesus looked like, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but right. I, too, wanted to know what Jesus looked like, because when I right. said, Jesus, what are you doing here? He immediately moved in, and in front of my face, took up my entire field of vision hmm. with his head and shoulders. I could see plainly see his hair. It was parted in the middle, longer, and wavy brown. Mm -hmm. And that might have been what I've seen in pictures or something. I don't know. But I, I, I do know that, you know, Jesus and God can take other forms. But sure. that's how I saw Jesus. And, um, but the face, I still could not see Jesus's face. It was blurred out. It had these sort of cloudy striations going across the face. And so I said, <laughs> and I have to laugh because I, I feel very often like, Back then, especially, I, I asked the most superficial question you can ask if <laughs> Jesus shows up to you. I, I said, well, what do you look like? Yeah. <laughs> I could have asked a million things. And I said, well, what do you look like? Yeah. But I do believe, Brian, that that question was one that Jesus knew I would ask. Mm -hmm. Because immediately when I asked that question, my attention, vision, if you will, was snapped to the right. And I saw falling before me, as you would see a deck of cards being rifled through, mm -hmm. were pictures. They were pictures of every type of human being. And it was very fast, but I could absorb that it was man, woman, child, Asian, black, white, everything um, okay. flipping through and i could even tell that some were poor some were rich mm -hmm. you could i could see that as fast as those were being flipped through mm -hmm. and the thought came to me and i could even tell it came to me from the others where jesus had been mm -hmm. and i was looking at his picture and the thought came this way and it was like i look like everyone because i am everyone we are one wow we are one so I absorbed that. And as I understood that message, a picture, the last picture fell on the top of the pile. And then it rose up further, higher, and further to the right. Mm -hmm. And it was clearly a picture of a father and a son. And uh, the message was, I am the father and the son. That was the thought that was conveyed to me. Wow. And as soon as I uh, understood that, there was one 
other part of this. And I'm not going to involve that in this interview because it's a little more personal. But, um, and I think that it has something to do. I think it's a message or sort of a, um, you know, a, uh, not a warning, but sort of a um, prompt to be aware of something in the future. But that, yeah. that's in my book and I'm not going to really go into that because the most important things right now, I, I believe were that, you know, we're all one. Yeah. That's the message. We yeah. are all one. So <laughs> I, uh, as soon as the, I got this last piece of the message and it was very personal, but as soon as I realized I understood it, the whole scene went away and I opened my eyes and I sat up and I'm like, I just saw Jesus. Mm. And I leaned over to my husband, who is also, I don't want to say my husband was uh, agnostic, but he was brought up Catholic, but he was one of those uh, persons who uh, had that background, but never gave any thought to religion or God or any of that. Right. And just also in his childhood. So I shook him awake and I went, wake up. I just, I just saw Jesus, you know, he just appeared to me. Yeah. And my husband was, I didn't really get the reaction that I wanted. Of course, <laughs> like other people, you know, well, you're probably just dreaming and tell me about it in the morning. Mm -hmm. Well, I did not sleep all night. I laid there staring, you know, at the ceiling thinking, you know, what does this all mean? And, but, you know, I know it was real. And I told myself, I remember telling myself, don't ever forget that this was real. Hmm. Told myself that because I know myself. Right. Sure enough, Brian, <laughs> you know, a week later, I was falling into that same old logical brain centered thinking of it was probably just a dream. Mm -hmm. I've heard of lucid dreams and, you know, it's probably just something, some kind of dream I never, you know, experienced before. Mm -hmm. So I started teetering back toward that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't done though. I mean, the, the, the learning continued. Yeah. So um, let's take a drink here and then I'll continue. Yeah, sure. Questions? I can answer those now. Well, you know, it's interesting that, um, okay, so you, the, the first experience you relayed was really kind of a matter of timing. Um, it was that you had this, you know, had this thought and you were asking about suffering and people come to your door and say suffering is not going to last forever. And then the second thing we have is this experience you have when you're sleeping, uh, which you, you, I guess, subsequently dismissed as, a, as maybe a dream. So it sounds like these experiences are building. So I'm curious to hear what the next one is. They are building, and um, I'll jump it just ahead a little bit. Mm -hmm. The um, originally, I, I I I had some difficulty in terming what was my core experiences because there were three things that happened pretty closely together, and I've told you the first two. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth one, the very last one, happened. Um, it had to be maybe a couple years later, mm. uh, and it had to do with these experiences, but it was the one thing that finally drove me from, I would say, being a 98, 99% full-on believer mm -hmm. to, I mean, really 100% full-on believer. Okay. But I'll go on to the third experience, and All the right. third experience was probably, for me, the hardest to believe. So... After these first two things happened, uh, again, I, I went on and I was vacillating between, is this real? Is this not real? It's really hard to believe, you know, if it is, if these things are happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did begin reading things. And, and I have to say, I never read the Bible before this. And I still, <laughs> after seeing Jesus, I still didn't want to read the Bible <laughs> because mm -hmm. I was like, I know about the Bible history. I know it's been you know, manipulated yeah. uh, power purposes. Uh, I know there's, uh, it's hard to read, a lot of translation. I did have a Bible though, and it was, I kept it in my bottom nightstand drawer. My stepmother had given it to me. My stepmother is Christian and she always was trying to get me to come to church with her and so forth. And mm -hmm. um, so one year she, for Christmas, she gave me a Bible and I shoved it in that drawer and I never saw the light of day again mm -hmm. before this third experience. So, um, but I had been reading other things about, uh, you know, I, I would pick up some books at the bookstore about angels and, uh, you know, a few here and there about Jesus and, and whatnot. Um, but as I was reading these books, ever so often, I would come uh, around to the idea of reincarnation. Hmm. Okay. And uh, I thought, 
you know, it's hard enough for me to believe in angels and Jesus and this reincarnation stuff. That's uh, Eastern baloney. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't really fit into my paradigm mm-hmm. that I'm this new paradigm even. Right. So I would just flip past it. Well, one night <laughs> as I was reading, I came, you know, it was the end of the evening and I came upon reincarnation again and I read a little bit about it and I, you know, it might've been about two or three paragraphs, not a whole lot, Mm -hmm. but then I closed the book and I said, eh, whatever. And I went to bed and I prayed that night. And of course, by now my prayers were taking on a little more meaning, a little more heartfelt. Mm -hmm. And I prayed. And at the end of that prayer, I very casually threw out to God. I said, and you know what, God, this reincarnation stuff, if it's real, have I ever lived before? And who was I? Thank you. Good night. You know, amen. And I went to sleep. Well, very much like when Jesus visited me, I was sleeping. And again, on the left, I don't know what the left has to do with it, but uh, I was awakened I was in a deep sleep. I know I was in a deep sleep. I wasn't dreaming. I was awakened within myself. Mm. And my attention was directed to the left. And this is a, <laughs> said the last thing was the weirdest thing that ever happened, but this was even weirder. So I looked over to the left. And as I looked, these letters came at me in this manner. And I will spell out a name that was given to me. Mm. So I looked and the letter A came forward. And as it receded, a B came forward. It receded an S came forward. And this happened Hmm. until I said the name. Mm -hmm. And the name was Absalom. Hmm. And I said this name as the letters came slowly. I said, Absalom. Hmm. And when I finished saying it, they came at me a second time, a little quicker. Absalom. When I ended it, I, I said Absalom as the letters came at me. Mm-hmm. They came at me a third time, mm-hmm. quicker yet. Absalom. And it almost flowed off of my tongue mm-hmm. the third time. This is a name I had never heard before. And if I had heard it, I certainly didn't remember it. Yeah very strange name. But the third time the name came at me, I saw that it was coming off the top right hand corner of a Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, a Bible has a very distinctive look with the small writing, thin kind of pages. It was clearly Mm -hmm. a Bible. And this name was coming off, being projected off of that page. Mm -hmm. So the, the third time I said it, and I said it fluently, Absalom, The entire vision stopped, went away, and I opened my eyes. Hmm. And I was like, I knew God had just given me an answer. This was not me. This was not my brain. This was God. Wow. Answering a direct question I had just asked before I closed my eyes. Mm -hmm. So knowing that I had that Bible in my bottom nightstand drawer, I jumped off the bed. I, you know throwing all the junk out of the drawer, (laughs) getting to that Bible. And I found it. It still had a little piece of wrapping paper tape to it, tore that off. I jumped back on the bed and it wasn't over yet because as I opened that Bible, I did not rifle through the Bible. I grabbed the Bible with all intention of, I was going to, you know, probably have to, you know, look through it to find if this was there anywhere. Mm -hmm. Brian, I opened that Bible the first time to the exact page where Absalom's story was written and the name Absalom appeared in that top right hand corner. Wow. As I had saw seen it in that vision. Wow. So I did I did not feel any hands on me. I did not feel anything, but I mean, I can only imagine that God was somehow in the room there Hmm. and somehow opening or having his hands on me and opening the Bible to the, to the exact page. I can't explain how it happened or how God works, but that's what happened. Yeah. And so, uh, I read 
the story. I had to actually back up a couple pages to where the story of Absalom started in uh, 2 Samuel. Um, and I read the story. <laughs> and uh, after I read the story, I told God I, I thought he made a mistake. Because <laughs> I said, whoa, okay, well, I appreciate you giving me an answer, but uh, I think maybe you ought to check again because <laughs> there's no way I could have been this person. So if you, uh, do, do you happen to know who Absalom? I, I know the name, but I can't remember the story. Yeah, well, Absalom was the third son of King David. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he was King David's favorite son, apparently. But he wasn't altogether a, a great dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he actually ended up killing his brother uh, out of revenge. And he tried to usurp the kingdom from his father because he thought his father was too soft on people. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't met out justice as he should. Mm -hmm. And Absalom was all about revenge and, you know, making sure people suffered for what they did wrong. Wrong. Wow. Wow. Uh, so I was Absalom in a past life. I'm, you could not convince me otherwise. I know that I was Absalom. Wow. Now, I know also I've had some other lives and, and that comes into play in my story too. But mm -hmm. uh, there's this third part. Again, very hard to believe, but this third experience had tacked onto it three confirmations because I refused to believe this. <laughs> and uh, the first confirmation came about a week later when I was outside mowing the lawn. It was spring. I was mowing the lawn for the first time. And we had this bank of trees in the backyard. It was uh, baby trees. And I never had any problems mowing under those trees. Um, so and they, it always came last. But I came around and as I was mowing the yard, I was constantly talking to God about this reincarnation and Absalom and that I had been Absalom and I could mm -hmm. not understand it because I felt I'm a pretty good person and I'm the kind of person who literally gets flies out the door. I won't kill them, mm -hmm. you know, which bothers my husband. But anyway, as I was mowing, uh, coming around under this bank of trees, I was asking God, for, I asked God for a confirmation. I said, can you co please confirm that you have this right, that, that I was Absalom, <laughs> that it wasn't just a dream, because I was also doubting again. Right. And as I was mowing under those bank of trees, and as I asked for that confirmation, the tree grabbed, and, and I often wear my hair in this little ponytail, the tree grabbed my hair. And it wasn't just like a little, oh, my hair got caught. It felt like a yank on <laughs> my ponytail. Mm -hmm. And I understood immediately that that was my confirmation because Absalom had died in the woods of Ephraim when he was being in pursuit of his army and his, his hair, which he uh, was known for having this long, beautiful hair, mm -hmm. uh, got caught in a, a terebinth tree, which is oh, a kind wow. of an oak tree. It got caught in this tree and the donkey rode out from under him. And the troops caught up with him and speared him and killed him. Oh, wow. Wow. So when I asked for that confirmation and my hair got caught in the tree and I immediately understood it, I didn't even have time to feel, like to reach up and yank my hair. I understood it and then the, it released. And things happen like that. I've learned since that spirit works very quickly and God knows, spirit knows uh, when you understand something, mm -hmm. just like the pictures were flipping through, mm -hmm. I could see, I could absorb that, but it was going so fast. I know in my, uh, hu humanness, uh, I could never have seen those spaces going by that quick, but in my conscious state that I was in mm -hmm. spirit state, I could see all those, those pictures. And so anyway, uh, to get back to this hair thing, yeah. I, after the tree released, I had a, a, a chuckle with God. I mean, I, I could feel the chuckle. And I knew again that, okay, I was Absalom. I'll, I'll buy that. I understand. <laughs> you didn't make a mistake. Go figure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how much time do we have left, Brian? Oh, we've got, we've got time. Um, so 
you, these experiences are just amazing. I'm, I'm kind of dumbfounded. I don't know what to say. So at this point you believe, um, and then <laughs> you're, you're still not quite there. Well, that's the reason for the title caught between heaven and earth mm -hmm. is because as these things were happening to me, I felt in this surreal battle with myself of, you know, being, uh, in spirit mm -hmm. and being, you know, grounded in my earthly logical self. And I kept vacillating between these two as these sure. experiences were happening. So yeah. I guess I'm pretty hard not to crack, but, uh, you know, when these things happened, I believed them. I knew there was something going on, but then give me a few days, a week, whatever. And I started thinking, Oh, come on. I know better than that. That was a dream. That was just a dream. Yeah. And even after this first confirmation, Brian, I found myself, you know, and, and maybe it was a little started to be a little more time in between, but I found myself, uh, you know, doubting again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did, didn't want to believe it. And I thought, oh, gosh, my hair just got caught in that tree. How silly of me. And it was my own, you know, creative mind thinking that I felt God and myself chuckling together. Mm hmm. So, uh, the next thing that happened, uh, was the second confirmation to this idea that I was Absalom. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my family, I have an international family. My two stepchildren live in Holland. My husband's from Holland and, uh, my daughter lives in the States here. And we, the three of us, my husband, my daughter, myself lived in Ohio at the time. Well, every year, because we're separated, we would plan this long family vacation, three week mm -hmm. family vacation. And we always went somewhere, you know, where we would all have a say in where we were going after the kids got a little older. So it'd been many years that they were already, you know, having a say and whatnot. And this particular year, we decided we were going to go to a tropical beach. Uh, we had been to some city vacations before and everyone was ready for a beach vacation, including myself, you know, mm -hmm. especially with these weird things going on. I was like, I need a breather from, I just want to go lay on the beach. So uh, that's where we were going. And one night my husband and I were both on the couch and I was looking through my iPad. Uh, I had four different windows open with different beach deals on it. Uh, my husband was on the, under the, the other end of the couch doing his, his sudu Sudoku. And uh, I kept getting a pop-up on my screen and it was a pop-up for Ireland um, and it was irritating me and I kept swiping it away and I was like gosh darn this thing how do I stop this from happening mm -hmm. and my husband grabbed the iPad and goes let me see let me fix it you know and I'm like no don't don't turn it off because that's his answer to everything is just to close <laughs> it up, you know? and I'm like oh you'll lose my windows mm -hmm. And he, instead, he's like, well, what is this pop-up anyway? And he's like, Ireland. He goes, well, I've actually never had a vacation in Ireland. And I'm like, oh, no, mm -mm, we're going to the beach. You know, and he's like, well, let me, let me see. He's like, whoa, this is a really good deal. You know, a family of five for, you know, a couple weeks, we have to get really good deals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. this Ireland thing was kind of unreal. And... Uh, we called my daughter out of what I call her rabbit hole because in a you're a teenager, you're always in your bedroom, you know, so we called her out and uh, her name's Bailey Gallagher. So her grandparents on my, from my first husband, uh, her grandfather was from Ireland and um, she always wanted to go to Ireland with a name like Bailey Gallagher, eventually got to get there. Yeah. So anyway, we called her out of her rabbit hole. We're like, Bailey, what do you think of dropping the beach vacation and going to Ireland? And she's like, hell yeah. You know, she was all for it. And I'm like, but what about Jasper and Danique? You know, my two stepchildren mm -hmm. who were in Holland. And for them, it was the middle of the night. Um, so we couldn't call them and ask them, you know, can, are you okay for us to change this? Now I have to, to note too, that the time difference that we were on for them, it was like two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't call them. And the other notable thing about this was this deal for Ireland ended at midnight. Oh. So we had to make a decision. And my husband was like, yeah, yeah, we got to go. My daughter was like, yeah, yeah, we got to go. So we made a very unprecedented uh, parental, you know, decision that, okay, we're going to change everything and we're going to book this deal. And we did. Mm. And uh, 
we don't book our vacations too far out because of my husband's travel schedule. So it was only a few weeks later that we found ourselves all in Ireland. Mm -hmm. My stepchildren weren't exactly happy about it. You can read a lot of things in the book. So <laughs> a lot of funny things that go on with our family, but primarily because they live in a rainy country and Ireland is also a rainy country. Yeah. yeah. Nonetheless, we were in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And about this time, I started asking God for a second confirmation. Uh, I, you know, I understood that, uh, you know, well, what, what I was doing was I was doubting and I was doubting that that tree, you know, had anything to do with mm -hmm. this, et cetera, et cetera. So I was asking God for a confirmation that I knew that I couldn't mistake that it had to do with Absalom. Okay. okay? Give me an unmistakable uh, you know, clarification on this. So we were in Ireland, uh, a confirmation on this. We were in Ireland and the first day uh, we found out why the vacation was so cheap. We were in the boondocks and we had to drive like, you know, two hours to get to anywhere that we really wanted to see anywhere anybody's heard of. Mm. But there was this castle nearby and a castle that not too many people have heard of called Bunratty. I don't know if you ever heard of Bunratty. Castle. I haven't, no. I had never heard of it either. Yeah. But we were close by to that. And that was like the only thing. So our first day, having been tired and everything, we decided we're just going to go over to this castle and then take it easy for the first day. Mm -hmm. So we travel over there and we're in the castle and uh, my kids take off to the upstairs. They run wherever they're going to go. And it was, there were hardly anybody in, in this castle. And we're in this big, grand, great room that you first step into. But there was this professor type with a handful of what looked to me like college students. And they were talking uh, about this humongous tapestry that was hanging on the wall. And he said, uh, this tapestry is depicting the life of Absalom. And I just had my whole body shook. I had chills. Yeah. And my husband knew that I was asking again for a confirmation. And we looked at each other and his jaw fell to the floor wow. this time. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God. Okay. That's my confirmation. So, I mean, in our, you know, 15 years of marriage by that time, we had never, ever overridden uh, what all of us had voted for, for a right, vacation. Right, right. Right. Except this one time. And again, it's, it's like you said, Brian, it's timing. Yeah. It's timing. It so is. that whole pop-up, everything. That could not have been coincidence. That was orchestrated. Yeah. I'm absolutely positive that that was orchestrated. So in my book, I have a picture of myself under the tapestry, not know, know, knowing whether I should smile happily or <laughs> contemplate him because it made me happy that I had this confirmation. Yeah. At the same time, I still was not happy to have been Absalom and I still could not understand it. So by this time, I had found the near-death experience literature, mm -hmm. and so many near-death experiencers talk about uh, reincarnation and that they're told of reincarnation. Some of them are shown their past lives. Yeah. Uh, so I was very intrigued by that, and I started to listen to what some of these near-death experiencers said about our soul being on a trajectory. And... I thought, well, maybe it's not so bad if I went from being Absalom, who could kill his brother, uh, you know, and take over his father's kingdom to myself, who doesn't kill a fly, you know, and I feel like I'm a pretty good person. You know, if that's the trajectory I've been on, maybe it's not so bad. Yeah. So uh, I then began asking for a third confirmation, but not that I was Absalom because that had come, you know, I, I had, had started to accept that. Mm -hmm. But the confirmation was, am I on the right track? Okay. Is, is my understanding of our soul's journey uh, correct? You know, and should I keep learning in this mm -hmm. direction? And I got an, a third confirmation and I had to ask for that confirmation confirmation to be really anything specific but mm -hmm. uh 
as I had asked for this, my sister and I, uh, for a couple years, we had been trying to go to this uh, thing called the Cleveland Flea, which was an indoor flea market in Cleveland. By this time, it was rolling around uh, November and Christmas was coming and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided one particular Sunday that we were going to go this year. You know, we were made it a priority. We're going to go. So uh, we drove up to the Cleveland flea. And for me, it was about a 40 minute drive uh, up to Cleveland, Ohio, where, you know, I lived in that area at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get to the Cleveland flea and we're standing in line and out comes a gentleman saying, sorry, no one else is allowed in. The fire marshal has closed us down and, you know, nobody else is coming in today. Just closed the door and that was it. And we were almost in the door from this line. So we were so bummed. We'd been trying to go for a couple of years and this was our year to get into it. Mm -hmm. So we got back in the car and we're driving around Cleveland. We're like, well, what, what do you want to do? And we're like, oh, the only thing else that's open is the art museum. So neither of us were particularly art people, uh, but I'm always open for new things. So we went to the art museum and uh, we got up to the second floor and my sister said, well, I'm gonna go look at this exhibit over here. And I said, well, I want, I'm gonna go over here and see what, what's through these glass doors. Mm -hmm. So and keep in mind about the timing, because I mean, even as much as the night before, I was asking God for an under, you know, confirmation on the understanding of this. Mm -hmm. So I go into those double glass doors and I sit on a bench in front of the first painting and I channel my inner art critic and I'm looking at this painting and I'm like, well, you know, this guy, he's sitting near this wall and he looks a little distraught. He looks Persian. He had an earring and, you know, and then I noticed there was a crown at his feet. And I said, well, yeah, the colors are kind of somber and that's the extent of my art critic, <laughs> you know, the, how far I could go. Mm -hmm. So I got up off the bench and I was going to go to the next painting and I grabbed my glasses out of my purse and I put them on. I wanted to see what the name of the painting was. And I looked in and it's like, <gasps> David mourning the loss of Absalom. Mm -hmm. Wow. And not only did it hit me as a confirmation, Brian, but it hit me as a story of the prodigal son. So as I know now, uh, David had always loved Absalom in the way that God always loves us, hmm. no matter that we walked away from yeah. God. Yeah. And for, for Absalom, it didn't matter to David that he had tried to usurp his kingdom and had killed another one of his sons. David loved Absalom. And he, even when Absalom, he welcomed him back into the kingdom. This was before he tried to take over. And after he killed his son, uh, he had exiled Absalom, mm -hmm. but then welcomed him back into the kingdom. And yeah. the relationship started to go a little bit better. But again, Absalom harbor, harbored revenge in his heart and he wanted justice. Uh, so those, when, when I knew what that picture was, it hit me immediately, the story of the prodigal son, as well as the confirmation. And again, that has been really paramount to my journey. Not only is that my story, but it's a story of all of us because we yeah. are all one and we are children of God and we are part of God. Uh, and we walked away. And that's my understanding right now. We walked away of our own free will. But just like uh, you're a parent, I'm a parent. Uh, one of the things that can hurt me very much is when my daughter doesn't call, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. She doesn't call. I know she loves me, but she doesn't necessarily call that often. And even when I try to reach out to her, she's busy. Oh, I can't talk much, mom. You know, it hurts. Yeah. And I believe that, uh, you know, God wants us to have our free will, but it hurts God when we don't care about that connection. And so that's one of the things that I discovered. Yeah. Well, I want to, um, I want to expand out on what you, what you just said, because I think you, it was, a, it's a fascinating story and I definitely encourage people to get the book to, I, I know there's a whole lot more detail that you weren't able to do in just a short period yeah. of time, 
but we touched on the role of suffering and we, you also touched on this idea of getting quiet. And I was, as you were saying, I was taken because so for so many of us, we don't get quiet until we are put in that position. Like we are with this virus, like we are with the diagnosis, like we are with a, a grief event. There's something usually that, that has to be really painful to stop us and slow us down. You were fortunate you didn't have to go through that. But we right now, I think as humanity, are going through that. So what are your thoughts on the role of suffering? Well, uh, I do believe suffering is a gift. And uh, it, that's hard to come to terms with. But if you do look at this pandemic and the suffering that's going on, and, uh, you know, of course, the suffering with people dying, and if you know somebody who's died or who has this, that suffering, of course, is great uh, with, with a, a, a biological type suffering. But if you look at it in the broader perspective, again, that gift of suffering can be to uh, slow down, to uh, learn patience, to learn uh, to live in the silence and to get back that connection with God. Um, if you want to talk more about this very specific suffering of people who are suffering with um, diseases or disorders or whatnot, very often those people do come out of their suffering having learned uh, great lessons. Yeah. Um, you know, they. Uh, one of the examples I can think of is the gal who started the Nancy Nancy uh, Komen, Susan G. Komen Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that came out of the, her suffering, uh, her sister's suffering, I believe, from cancer. Uh, and that whole organization, and that happens many times that organizations like that come out of suffering, that we can uh, use those to uh, end the suffering, to help uh, cure the mm -hmm. disease or whatnot. I do know, uh, I'll give you a quick story too about uh, suffering, particularly in regard to when we, our loved ones suffer, we suffer too. And I remember a, a story a woman told once, uh, she was a near-death experiencer, and I'm sorry, I don't recall her name. But she had spent a good portion of her adult life trying to help her sister out of drug addiction. And, uh, you know, she had some recoveries and it would always relapse. But eventually her sister recovered and, and she went, I believe, a year or something. And it looked like it was going to be smooth sailing from, from there. And then her sister died, uh, tragically, unexpectedly, not from drugs, but I think it was a car accident or something. And her sister uh, was in that suffering of her, her sister's death. And she was mad at God. Uh, and she went on being mad at God. And she was living and, and drowning in the suffering because she had loved her sister so much and it got her through all of this. And it took up a big portion of her life. And uh, at one point, this woman herself had a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And she met her sister in heaven. And her sister came to her and she was mad at her. She said, I'm so mad at you. We just got you past the drug addiction and then you left. Why did you do that? And her sister laughed and she goes, you just don't remember. She goes, we agreed to that because you needed to learn compassion. So I agreed to come to, to uh, this earth school with you and be a drug addict so that you could learn compassion. And so very often in our suffering, if whether we're the one with the disease or, or the illness going on, we give other people the opportunity to learn. And those people who are you know, helping us or helping their loved ones through things or getting through a death, we learn in that manner as well. We learn our compassion. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's so many different facets to suffering and how we can learn from it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and I've heard people say that, you know, someone with the cancer diagnosis that will say that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Not yeah. that we would ever wish that for ourselves, but it gives them that chance to slow down and really appreciate what they have and to just slow down, like you said, and kind of remember. And I think, um, I think right now as, a, as humanity, we're kind of like all being forced to slow down and to think and to evaluate and hopefully, you know, we'll learn something from this, something, something redemptive will come out of it. 
That's um, exactly right. And um, just to uh, add on to that just a bit, you know, our earth has been suffering for a very long time. And I, I think mm -hmm. uh, I view Mother Earth as an organism unto herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the great things to come out of this pandemic is the pollution factor has gone way down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, and I think the earth is healing itself through this. Yeah, that, that's another lesson to be learned. I, I, and we're, before we wrap, I, I want to talk to you about IONS because I know it's an organization that's near and dear, I think, to both of us. And I was introduced to you by our mutual friend, Lilia. Um, yeah. And I, so what's your, what's your uh, how did you get involved with IONS and what's your role there? Well, um, when I started having these experiences, you know, uh, some way through them, and I told you I was uh, reading some things. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to the internet, of course, and I was like, is anybody else experiencing the kind of things that I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I found that near death experiencers were, and they were being told of our oneness. Uh, you know, we're all facets of God, uh, just as the sun, you know, has rays. We are those rays coming out from God, you know, to give you an analogy. Um, they were talking about their past lives and they were saying that when I was in heaven, I was shown my past life. And uh, there's one uh, uh, near-death experiencer in particular, Dr. Uh, Rav Parti, P-A-R-T-I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, his story. Know, his story, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an anesthesiologist who was, you know, addicted to his own product, you know, addicted to drugs. And he was shown that in a past life, he had been an opium farmer and was addicted to his own product. And hmm. he had not yet learned that lesson of using substances to, you know, feel good mm -hmm. and that the connection that you need is, is with God. So I found uh, IONS through that and the near-death experience community. And there are a lot of great, great websites and IONS has all kinds of near-death experiences uh, written uh, and contained within their, their site. So they do a lot of good work and it's IONS.org if you want to look them up. Yeah, I, I uh, actually go to the local meetings here in Cincinnati. I'm not an experiencer. Um, I haven't had any even experiences like you have, but it's it's fascinating to me all the lessons that are that come out of those experiences. And we don't have to go through the near death experience to to learn those things. We can learn them. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, after my experiences, uh, something happened to me that happens to a lot of near death experiencers. I what I the way I describe it is I became open. Mm -hmm. So I have had since then uh, instances of spontaneous mediumship oh, wow. uh, where a spirit will come through to me. And it's been very, very few, mm -hmm. but uh, because I haven't pursued that too much or tried to, uh, you know, get better. I've had channeled writings. I've had these kind of things that happen and I do believe they are gifts of the spirit mm -hmm. so as humanity itself evolves and we start to remember who we are and that's you know part and parcel of my title the truth of our existence right we are uh God I mean God is us and we are God we are all one and as we remember that we come into our gifts uh our true self and those are the same gifts that God has, omnipresent, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing. And, and eventually, I believe humanity will get to that. And more and more of us are coming into our gifts. Mm -hmm. And I realized after these experiences, things that I sort of blew off, uh, I definitely uh, know now they were already my gifts becoming open because I had a premonition of 9-11. Oh, wow. And I told my boss about it uh, the day before it happened. And, uh, you know, I just thought it was the weirdest dream. And I, of course, at that time blew it off. But after all these things happened, I know now that uh, I was coming into my, uh, you know, my true self in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Nancy, it's been really great. Um sharing this time with you and, and learning about your experiences and what you've learned from them and what, can, what we can all learn from them. I want to uh, repeat your contact information for everybody again. Uh, the book is Caught Between Heaven and Earth, My Profound Exper Encounters with God and the Remarkable Truth of Our Existence. Um, Nancy's holding it up for people that are watching on YouTube. Uh, I assume that's available on Amazon and everywhere. 
Barnes and Noble, Amazon, yes. And uh, Nancy's Let's website, website. <laughs> uh, Nancy's, Nancy's website is nancyvanalphen.com and that's V-A-N-A-L-P-H-E-N. I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, Nancy, thanks for being here. Uh, do you have any final words? I do, Brian. I just wanted to mention, mention the one incident, the fourth incident that uh, had me uh, from, you know, even at that time, I had some doubt after those three main experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. I call myself 98, 99% believer. <laughs> I'll just leave the readers with this and I'll let them read the details. Sure. But the, third, the fourth thing that happened to me, and it was spaced out a little bit, uh, was that once again, before I went to bed, I asked God a direct question. And this time I did not get an answer in my sleep. When I woke up that morning and I was fully awake, I was given an audible answer by God. Whoa. <laughs> well, my umbrella just fell over here. But uh, there's an audible an aud answer. Audible, audible answer by God. And uh, it was very, very um, uh, different than the answer I thought I would get to a, this particular question. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, that, that's a good way to end it. Nancy, it's been really great getting to know you. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me on the program. Thank you, everybody who's watched. And uh, I hope you will pick up the book. And um, it's very inspiring. And I'm never out to convince or, you know, uh, try to convert anybody to anything. But uh, I do believe that the more people are exposed to my story, other near-death experiences stories, the more that does open you up. And if you're just thinking about things on your own, that's helpful uh, for your journey. And uh, I wish everybody well and stay safe and healthy during this pandemic and look for the silver lining. It is there. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. You have a great day. Thank you, Brian. You too. Bye. Bye. That's it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you got something out of it. Please stay in contact with me by reaching out at www.grieftogrowth.com. That's grief, the number two, growth.com. Or you can text the word growth to 31996. That's simply text growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. Since you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure you're subscribed. So hit the subscribe button and then hit the little bell here and it'll notify you when I have new content. Always please share the information if you enjoy it. That helps me to get more views and to get the message out to more people. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day.